for MIMS Radio, which was a live stream video podcast uh, um, uh, broadcast in association with the Phi Center here in Montreal. So right now, I would like to invite um, one of our panelists to come up here. We're going to dive into the, uh, the nitty gritty and uh, take a deep dive into each of these incredible stations here. So first up, I'd like to invite Sandra Borsch from The Lake Radio in Copenhagen. This one? Yeah, check. Okay, so what is The Lake? It's an experimental music radio station based in Copenhagen, and we've uh, been there since 2014. And um, we like to think our, it should be a gift, this one, but whatever. Ah, it's working, perfect, okay. Um, we like to think our, of ourselves as the antithesis of commercial radio, uh, meaning that we broadcast a carefully selected um, um, stream of music and sound from all genres throughout all times and in all language. We are dedicated to present contemporary um, and experimental music with the aim to create an, an alternative platform uh, for a device or a diverse range of artistic activities in the context of um, experimental music and contemporary art and sound art. So this is just a quick note. Um, we have like four frequencies at our radio station. Uh, we have our flow, our updates, our mixes and shows, and we have events and festivals. So just to run through our flow, is um, this is a screenshot from our website. And this is like, um, the flow is our heartbeat of the lake. Um, our website has basically two main features, which are play button and you can save. So during your listening experience at the lake, you can like star the tunes you like the most and you get like at the end of your listening session, you can email your track list. And then there's just a quick overview of the upcoming shows. Um, the updates um, is how we develop and expand the tracks of the lakes, of the lake, sorry. And uh, this is just uh, uh, some examples of the different updates we have. Like, for example, we had, we celebrated Moondog's uh, birthday a couple of years ago, so we dedicated an entire update to him. And otherwise, it's friends, artists, um, festivals, different institution who contribute to like uh, updating the lake's streams. Um, this is uh, uh, just an example of the mixes and, and radio shows we have. Um, we have mixes from different artists um, and it's a mix of both us, the lake, taking contact to the different artists and the artists taking contact to us. Um, wanted to contribute to the lakes to the lakes flow, um, and we also have like different podcasts from when we are out of the studio. So we've been broadcasting from different festivals: Roskilde Festival, Fono Festival, Buralis Festival, and yeah, yes, and also from Tokyo. We hold we had this week. Uh, where we broadcast it live from a venue called Super Deluxe. Yeah, so the, yeah, whoops, moving on. So we have also uh, events and festivals where we like spread the message of the love for music. We have uh, our yearly event called Works for Radio where we commissioned 10 artists to make a special piece for especially radio or the medium radio, and it's uh, sound artists, uh, designers, um, all different kind of 
creative souls who been contributing to that. And it works like this, that we ask five artists who then get to pick one artist they wanted to like take into the project. So we learn new artists and we like um, lower the hierarchy in, in the booking, concept, in booking process, sorry. Then we have our festival in Berlin. Um, we've done that four times. And we also have a festival in Copenhagen and we do different takeovers. This is uh, an example of a takeover we did in Jazz House, a venue in Copenhagen. And um, yeah. So I wanted just to show you a like, short clip, uh, which I think capture the atmosphere of the lake pretty good. It's um, random, it's funny, and it's intelligent. Um, should I press the space button? Part one, sound and the human ear. Now, if you will lend me your ears while watching this picture on the screen, I will tell you about these invisible waves and how our ears are able to convert them to sound. You are listening to the lake. Each of the countless sounds in our environment originates in some object that vibrates. A stone hits the surface of a lake. Vibrations from the stone and the water push the air molecules, causing what we know as sound waves. This is only possible since the density of molecules is great enough so that the molecules can push on each other. By contrast, this can't happen in outer space, where there is no sound. That's because there is too much distance between the air molecules. Sound waves reach the human ear, causing the eardrum to vibrate. Located deep within the inner ear, a tiny organ called the cochlea contains so-called neural impulses, a kind of brain liquid. Vibrations from the eardrum are passed on to the liquid and again conveyed to the brain, which converts them into an actual sound as we perceive it. The human ear is capable of hearing frequencies between about 20 and 20,000 cycles per second, from the lowest to the highest. Which leads to a question, can there be a sound if there is no one to hear it? Yeah. So that was it. So I highly uh, encourage everyone who wants to contribute or to be engaged with the lake, just give a call or an email would be maybe better. Um, otherwise, you can find us there somewhere. Yes? Perfect. Thank you, Sandra. So next up, I would, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, 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 go ahead. <laughs> Maybe I should stand up here. Maybe that's a bit better. Um, so next, I would like to invite Jean-Denis Thériault um, from La Fespe right here in Montreal. Hello, everyone. It's a bit high. OK. So my presentation is. Uh, very short. <laughs> I have only three slides, but uh, I keep, I try always to keep it minimal, so that's the way I do it. So it's a small project, radio I made myself. Um, I have some help, but uh, I coded it myself and uh, I made it home. So it's a home project, basically. So here's a little overview of um, how you go to the website, you can click on uh, the play button. For instance, uh, at the moment, there's a Mutec programmation. And uh, you can scroll, you have all the past, the past shows that are available. They are archived on uh, a website called Mixcloud. 
So it's um, a UK website uh, helping a lot of community radio like uh, we have. Here we have a simple, um, how do we call it, a widget. So it's linked to our Facebook page. So it's adding a little color maybe to the simple layout. So yeah, I thought doing uh, this kind of simple layout was simple, but it took me a while actually to do it. <laughs> uh, let's change this. Hmm. Okay. Cool. Okay, here's an example, actually a video of uh, what the whoops actual space look like in our basement. So we do, it's not often we do this, but we can do small, uh, we don't have a lot of resource, so we, have, we don't have big cameras and, and, uh, and all, but we can manage to do sort of boiler room as, you know, a uh, little event like that. And we can go elsewhere also, because uh, it's the radio software is on the internet, so we can do a radio show anywhere, actually. So it's, uh, we want it to be flexible like this. And um, there's actual show in Paris and in uh, Argentina also. So uh, it's a small radio, but it's growing slowly also. And um, I'm starting to have more help, and uh, this is great. <laughs> so let's check the other one. Maybe I have to, okay. So this is, I, I, th um, I mentioned airtime, did I? So this is the software behind the website actually. So it helps for the, here we can see a calendar. So that's the place where you can create radio shows. You can add um, content actually from your library and uh, it's free. So if you are able to install it on a server, you have a radio. So this is a great tool. So, yeah, um, this is basically it. Maybe I can talk a little ab about the philosophy of the, the radio. Uh, I wanted it, like I said, to be flexible. So I want uh, anyone to be able to uh, say, let's say I want to make a radio show, but I want to make it monthly. It's possible. If uh, I want to um, make a radio show from uh, a bar on uh, an event, so it's a DJ oriented music radio mostly, so that's a possibility also. We like to do interviews. We had the chance to have actors even uh, that came at our studio to talk about how they their relationship with music, actually. And um, this was great. We didn't release all of them, actually, but it's about to come. Um, it's basically it. Maybe I'll say more later. <laughs> Thank you, JD. Uh, next up to the stage, I would like to invite Natalie Metz from uh, Ida Radio from Tallinn, Estonia. Hello. Hello. Uh, so I'm Natalie from uh, Tallinn, Estonia, and I'll present uh, Ida, which probably is the youngest out of all of these radios here because we uh, started on the project in uh, December, uh, but launched 1st of May, so it's like three months, four months. Um, yeah, uh, it's me uh, and uh, Robert Nikolaev and Leitzluik who started it as a result of a very random conversation at a party. Uh, but then it all scaled uh, pretty quickly and after six months we had a radio. Um, and um, I would say we have been weirdly lucky. So um, 
I'll show you the picture where we are. Uh, so we operate out of a shipping container, uh, which is in like the most hip and annoying area you could get. But uh, thanks to that, that area or district was very interested in having us. So I met up with the managers who run the area. I, I have to learn new words for area. Um, and I said that uh, I w we want to do a radio. They were, yeah, sure, what do you need? I said, a shipping container and 10,000 euros. And they were like, yeah, here you go. Um, <laughs> so uh, then we were able to start building it. Um, and uh, another lucky occasion was uh, a shopping mall that was interested in starting to sponsor us. Uh, so our monthly costs are around 2,000 euros and uh, they just give us the money to do it. And uh, in exchange, uh, we have their logo on our website. Um, also, some of the equipment we have, we were just, um, so for example, the like, big com computer uh, was given to us by uh, Apple. Uh, but we don't got, uh, haven't really got any uh, cultural funding yet because um, so far the Ministry of Culture uh, and the city have told us that this project is culturally uh, not relevant, um, which is uh, questionable for me uh, because uh, we've managed to uh, get more than 150 hosts doing more than 130 shows. We are a multi-genre radio, meaning that we do have a lot of techno and house music, uh, but also country music, um, classical music, um, metal, and so on. We also have talk shows, um, everything from like weird cooking shows to like shows about theater and art. Um, so with this three months that we have been running, or four, June, July, August, September almost, so four and a half. Uh, we've got uh, 5,000 unique listeners, which is pretty good for a country of one million people, uh, and about um, 100,000 listenings altogether. Also, uh, so what's the word? Listening again, Pre after listenings, whatever listenings of the recordings, we just received or um, we just achieved at uh, one million minutes, uh, it's 1.9 years. I, I guess it's a lot too. Um, so this is how it looks from the inside. It's very small. Um, I really love the lightened up panel we have there. Uh, and uh, on the picture with uh, Eleonora, you can see a little lamp that has the, a logo on it. That's all the shopping mall wants uh, for giving us money. So I think it's a pretty fair deal. Also, they play our music at their uh, mall every Friday uh, and have like banners uh, all over the place. So I think it's good. Um, yeah, so the reasoning behind it is, um, so this is what I usually tell to the Ministry of Culture, but I mean, whatever. It's up to them if they don't want to support us. Eventually they will. <laughs> but then, then we are so rich, we don't need the money anymore. Um, yeah, so we just want to offer a platform for local talent to share what they have, but also um, give the listeners something exciting and new to listen to. Uh, and they also see it as uh, a project of culture experts, uh, because uh, we do also have uh, foreign listeners, um, and whenever there is an exciting artist coming to Estonia, we try to get them to do a show and later share the mix. So slowly, but surely, maybe, uh, we will also have more listeners from the outside world. Um, so this is just something that seemed relevant to share. Yeah, great, cool. <laughs> Thank you, send me an email. Thank you, Natalie. And uh, final panelist, uh, we've got Mason here from uh, Antennas, right here in Montreal. Uh, 
Hello. There we go. Much taller. Can't wait to sit down. Um, my name is Mason Windles. I'm the one of the co-founders, and uh, I started as the programming director for Antennas. We were founded in September 2015 and started broadcasting um, February, between January and February, officially launching at the end of February 2016. Um, we originally were located out of the Arbutus Records office space, uh, which was a location donated to us in kind, and we are now located on um, St. Andre and uh, Jean Talon in a new office space also owned by Arbutus with our individual zone. Uh, all the equipment and things that we used to broadcast have been supplied by the original founders of the station. Uh, there's four of us, and it is a volunteer-run, non-for-profit, uh, internet, web-based radio. This is the website. This is our second version of the site. Uh, we've undergone a few different reskins, but as you'll see, there are quite a few different functions here. I do not have any. Here's a cool one. Uh, no pictures of our space, unfortunately. <laughs> I meant to put them on the backgrounds. Um, just walking through our website, because uh, unless some of you have seen it before, there are a few different functions. The One of our first and sort of most integral ones was this chat. We are an audio only website. Uh, we sort of avoided the video facet uh, that is a bit popular among other online radios. So people can log in here and have fun conversations all night uh, and forever. <laughs> here are a, here's a directory of most of our shows, which link to our mix cloud. Um, so you can find all sorts of existing programs. Unfortunately, not all of them are up here, but we have links to all of them here. And it will just start playing on the website. Uh, we have a bulletin board for sharing news. Here is our involvement here at Mutech. We have a shop and a link to our Instagram scheduling, archives, uh, information. There's some, there's some emails and a few different other fun uh, small features in the web design. Uh, the website was all built independently and coded from scratch uh, by a genius who <laughs> did everything that I do not understand about this world, so I'm not the best person to speak to it. But um, yeah, essentially, with regards to our mandate, we sought to create a platform uh, for the Montreal community to access and sort of share the different creative communities and outputs that we were either a part of or that we saw in, in Montreal, and as well as people who used to live here or just affiliated and associated uh, communities. Um, at this point, when we, well, when we started, we originally were hosting 12 hours of broadcasting a week spread over three different days, and now we are going at six days a week, and we have, pardon me, uh, a total of 133 regular shows, 76 of which are live, 57 which are pre-recorded, and do about 230 hours a month of new content, 130-ish uh, which are live. Um, we're a team of four core uh, co-founders and a set of many volunteers. Um, at the moment, or for the past three years, we've all been volunteers. And in February, we were able to obtain a small grant from the Quebec government to uh, pay salary stipends to four of our 
members, which enabled us to sort of free up a bit of time to focus on the project, hence the massive increase in programming, as well as a fun new space. Um, we wanted to create an open platform, so we've, we've had a big focus on offering live versus pre-recorded content, and this enables people from all over the world or even in Montreal to send in pre-recorded shows that can either be um, talk-based or music-based based on the level of comfort and desire of the people. We have a pretty substantial uh, set of shows from outside of Montreal, uh, including in Mexico, Chile, Portugal, France, Istanbul, Australia, and then across the United States, uh, as well as 17 in each Toronto and New York, or not New York, Vancouver. There's six in New York. Um, so I think that's mainly it of the programming uh, since the onset of our, or from the start of our station. We've tried to focus on creating a accessible platform for everyone. Um, and that's just been the mandate, I guess. Um, we have partnered with a lot of different organizations, Mutech, Red Bull, Rinse France, uh, Pop Montreal, and a few others that are escaping my mind. But through these partnerships, as well as through throwing events either with them or other local businesses, uh, we raise a bit of money. We have no uh, solid funding. It's all through merchandise sales, private donations, and um, I guess events. <laughs> so it's a cool station. If you'd ever like to donate, you can do it here or buy our, our uh, tote bag. <laughs> we will have more merchandise. And uh, you can reach us on this site. Here are all the links that you might need. And I think that's it for now. I'll be back. Thank you, Mason. So I would love to invite everyone up to the stage. You can all get cozy on the couch over here. I am really bad at stage direction here, clearly. Crossing in front of everyone. So, um, I mean, we talked a bit about like audience and a bit about community here. I guess, I mean, I would love to, to get sort of like a clear overview from everyone in terms of like, what communities are you, are you serving through the work that you're doing in your respective stations? I'll start. Um, as I alluded to, uh, our primary focus was serving the Montreal community. Um, each of us sort of came from a bit of a different area and we all had experiences and associations with different creative communities here in Montreal and um, looking around and sort of like your tweet, every radio has a web-based radio station and we saw Montreal did not at the time have this uh, platform for people to share their output. Um, so we started it and committed to figuring it out later. <laughs> we just um, thought that it would be a good idea to begin and open this platform, however small it was, and then sort of branch out from there. Um, a big part of it has been to uh, open this avenue for all sorts of communities that may not have access to it, uh, including marginalized communities. We've had a big focus on um, offering a, a diverse range of programs and hosts, uh, particularly um, women, non-binary, DJs, and other communities that just weren't the more, as you would say, cis hat house scene uh, that was kind of predominant in the online radio world. 
Um, from that, we wanted to sort of connect with people that had a connection to Montreal, and so we looked to these outside uh, people that we knew that were doing things that could tie back into it and sort of build those connections outward to the rest of the world. And uh, it started small, and as I sort of showed you, uh, it's growing across several different continents at this point. And um, what communities it serves, it's kind of a very, uh, we hope that it's serving a lot <laughs> at this point across like Baltimore and New York and Vancouver and Toronto, just pretty much wherever uh, these places exist and people want to bring them to us. And uh, then there's the community of our listeners and we hope that we're making them happy. <laughs> I think that's it for me. I can quickly say something. I think um, the, the lake started out in partly, some of us lived in Berlin and some of us lived in Copenhagen. But um, if you look at our listeners, 60% of our listeners is internationally and 40% is Danish. So I think in the whole debate, we're global versus local. I think uh, the fact that our listeners is so spread out of um, really shows that our community uh, is bound upon the, the passion for the experimental music and uh, the fact that we've gained this sort of like trust uh, from our listeners uh, that we have the trust that the lake is a place where you can listen for several hours or you can tune in for a broadcast you like um, just shows that the community is, is spread uh, all over the world actually um, so it takes like it takes community to another level in just or just being based in Copenhagen yeah that made any sense? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah? Okay. Perfect. What about what about you? Uh, well, Natalie. Uh, so I, I think that when it comes to community radio or like community, whatever, uh, then the essence is more or less the same always. Um, but so I can only because we are so young. Then I, I don't know how much listeners we or how important we will be in one year time. But right now, like one thing that was very important for us when we started with the programming mm, was to involve as many local communities as possible. So we didn't think that we're gonna do a radio for only ourselves. That's also why we have such a broad um, selection of genres and, and uh, musicians and DJs and thinkers and whatnot uh, contributing. Uh, I guess we want to uh, make the community bigger, maybe even grow a community, because one of the one of the things that I've been thought a lot is that um, I would be very happy that, let's say, in 10 years' time, if people are talking about 2018 or 19 or 2020, then people would say that, oh yeah, that, that, but this is when Ida started. And so it would be kind of like time defining as well. Maybe it's a very ambitious wish, but it's there. And how about for the first one? Oh, okay, so about community, that's it. Um, to me, it's about, it's a tool. Well, I made a tool for community to use uh, to express themselves. So I was a bit frustrated with uh, university radio, a uh, way of managing the podcast and technical stuff. So I started my little experiment uh, called radio. And um, now my challenge is to find a way to reach people who might be interested in participating in my project. So in terms of signal reach, I mean, some, you were mentioning, uh, Sandra, that it's, it's quite international, obviously for antennas as well. In, in Ida's case, 
how are you find like where where is that reach going? Like you said that I mean most of the programming has been happening. In yeah, well, right English now programming. I think that uh, like foreign listening gets or like countries that countries apart of Estonia are just Estonians somewhere else. So b because uh, right now we're still figuring out. I mean, talking about radio, I don't know anything about the subject. I don't know how to run an online radio. Um, so right now we're just figuring out uh, how it's all done. Uh, and then I think that like going international um, is like the next next step. Um, but I also think that it kind of is logical that you have to offer something that isn't there yet. So I guess that would be the answer. And for La Fasbe, what would you say like the predominant listening audience, like the feedback that you're getting, where are they coming from? If the audience, I, I'm not sure I, I get the... Oh, just in, yeah, uh, in terms of listeners, like where are you noticing people listening from? Um, it's a very small community, so I guess it's more between us and we're really trying to um, work on the visual presentation of each show, uh, making sure that there's a, a strong identity and uh, I need more help <laughs> for that. So putting a call out in the audience, yeah. It's um, a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think... I think at the reach of ours, we've had like listeners across 122 countries. Uh, we also use airtime, so and we have about two years of stats, so it's different from such a fresh station. But it can vary every month uh, so drastically, and it can be one person listening from Peru, uh, or it can be like 100 people in India listening, and it's just so interesting to see these different fluctuations and reach and depending on when it is and how it connects. But um, have you ever figured out why, why, why it does it happen? Um, well, much to the website's credit, I think it's mostly through like uh, people just finding it interesting and seeing it on blogs, hearing about that, and just you'll see it in the chat at like four in the morning, someone being like, just found this, it's so cool. And then they'll pop off. So it's I, I guess on average we have about like 80 countries that that will listeners will pop in. Uh, it's interesting. <laughs> it's such an interesting facet of online radio that uh, ties all these places together. Um, yeah. It's and everyone sort of mentioned like the financial model that you're or the business model that you're working off of is more from a nonprofit and uh, with some sponsorships, some interesting sponsorships there. Um, I mean, this, uh, first of all, like, this is so Mom. weird, uh, <laughs> like, how things like this don't happen. Um, but we have, like, the initial agreement for eight months, so, like, and four is over, so I'm, like, entering the phase of panic attacks because I haven't found, like, the next sponsor who would give us just money, but um, I'm sure we'll figure it out. Um, also, uh, we have uh, the don donation button. You should all check it out. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and uh, people actually push it every now and then. Um, but yeah, it has mainly been... So in the beginning, also, we had, had some bigger private donations. Um, yeah. Um, we also do events now and then, but events as such... I feel uh, it's always 50-50, like you can be successful, but then also like if you bring an international artist and there is a lot of going down that same night uh, in the city, maybe people will not come and then you'll end up losing money. We also have merch, but right now I feel that it's taking more money than giving us because I'm just <laughs> giving t-shirts for everyone because I want everyone to wear them. Um, so yeah, it's rather an investment, um, but we've been like pretty concrete that we're never gonna sell or like have ads uh, on like the station. So like different kind of collaborations, um, definitely up for them. But yeah, uh, still, 
I guess I have to figure out the business model. Us too. <laughs> I mean, what's everyone's comfort level on here on stage with uh, partnering with bigger brands? I mean, you mentioned that Antennas has done some uh, collaborations with uh, Red Bull and such. Yeah, it's mainly a, a case by case basis, and a lot of the time we we are sort of we have a big team, we have to meet and talk about all the different ups and downs of this and the effects that it might have on different members of our communities or our hosts and the people that contribute to make us who we are. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities that we'll pass up on in order to sort of evade those connotations or those issues, whatever it might be. Um, but that being said, we have partnered with uh, larger organizations and it's um, much to our, well, it hasn't been all that profitable for us. <laughs> so it's been a whole different uh, thing. We've been, we're a young station and a lot of these arrangements have just been to help us get in the door, help us get experience with a lot of these new hosts to give them opportunities. Um, to do things that were totally out of our reach. Um, but yeah, I would say that it is on a case-by-case -case basis and, and it's mainly around the individual events. Um, we haven't been the, we haven't really gone out and asked for much money from larger corporations. So that is maybe on our end. Maybe you can help us with that, but uh, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess that's all I can really say about it. Um, yeah. I have a question for mm -hmm. you. So cultural funding in Canada is good? It's uh, good or compared to many other places. Yeah, or it's so, so it seems. So do you have any money from there? We so far have had no luck with uh, any of the larger uh Canadian institutions such as Factor or SOCAN or the Can Canadian Council of Arts. Uh, we've applied for certain grants. Radio falls in this weird area where, as you mentioned, people don't necessarily see it as like a cultural export, which is weird. Um, so we're in between there. We did get this small grant from Quebec and Quebec, I guess provincially, places have different uh, priorities when it comes to culture, um, and Quebec is good about that. But yeah, it's a it's quite a small funding, and we would love to get access to bigger grants. But what we've understood from uh, working with different grant writers and sort of going through the application processes takes a lot of time, and like they have to understand who you are, and it's not just going to happen the first time. So. Maybe in a few years, if we're still going. How about the lake? What's the comfort level there? Hmm. Um, personally, I am complete schizophrenic about the whole sponsor thing. But when it comes to the lake, we've been uh, doing non-sponsorship at all. We are funded by, or not funded, sponsored, or we get funds from the Danish Art Council. Um, and we have a full-time fundraiser, so um, he uh, he works a lot and get uh, lots of, uh, not lots, but he gets to run the station. Um, we just recently built a new studio, so we decided to rent it, so we get um, income from that, because um, like the podcast, market is booming so we got a lot of like independent podcasters renting our studio and we also dj a lot or not a lot but we dj to party or so that's how we uh, make our money because i we've talked a lot about doing the sponsorship thing but at the end we've never been asked to do a sponsor thing and we've never like seeked it because um, I think we're too uh, we too DIY uh, to sell our souls to Red Bull or vodka, and I think uh, 
it's really not, it would just like, I, to me it would hurt the lake if we put on vodka or Red Bull on our tag, but again, if we like, if we reached out and maybe get in a dialogue with sponsorship, maybe it would be another question when the money was on the table, so I wouldn't say. So I'm kind of curious to kind of like scale this back just a little, little bit and just to get your opinion on like, what is it about radio that's just so compelling? Like why has this medium not gone anywhere? See, it's, it's all online. Well, they, the lake have a radio transmitter, just to say. Nice. Really? What's the what's the broadcast range? I don't know, but <laughs> it's there in Copenhagen, and we take it with us to the different festivals, and we put out radios around the corner. So in between the music, we make broadcasts, and you can tune in if you have your own device with us. But to make a quick uh, comment on your on your comment, um, I think um, the whole new generation of radio has moved from a device to an app or to streams. So I do agree on you with saying that right now we're talking about radio, but um, maybe it's because it's, it's lack of uh, a new term for the whole internet uh, web radio stations. Um, I think that because half of the lake is actually founded about uh, from friends that are in radio nerds, and that's also why we have the works for radio. Uh, so we're trying to like take some of the tradition from the old device and bring it into a. Uh, a new generation or a new new area uh, where it's just um, easier to use the internet. Um, You're completely dependent upon the internet. Radio is independent. You can listen to radio either on a transmitter or on a you know, government or not. The government would be unable to interfere with what you put out on your transmitter and well, without, they, there's ways they could. But you're completely different from radio. Radio means you have a local area where you're, you know, the definition of radio is the transmission and reception of electromagnetic waves of radio frequency, especially those carrying sound messages. And you're putting information on the internet. I'm, s I'm sorry, whose definition this is? This is not my definition. Well, that's the definition that comes up in the Cambridge Dictionary. <laughs> yeah. No, radio is a very strict definition. It's electromagnetic waves. None of you are putting out electromagnetic waves. You are webcasting. There's a big difference. Do you, ha do you have a better word of what we're doing? You're webcasting. You're putting out your information, your sounds onto the internet. And people with internet can receive your signals, but people without internet cannot. But also, I think that this is not the core about this panel. The core about the, this panel is rather maybe the community and... But the headline is radio is dead, long live radio. And I would say that, that the only, that, that it's absolutely right. I thought it was tongue in cheek, but it's absolutely right. Radio is dead. Not one of you, except for the lake, are talking about radio. The rest of you are talking about webcasting. The strict de definition new. of radio really, I mean, you have to talk about, it's called satellite radio also, and it just used cell systems and microwaves. So if you're really stuck in the idea that the original um, idea of radio is based purely on its technical uh, abilities, you're missing the whole larger conceptual and cultural idea around radio that exists in you know, sound art and radio art and what the means of broadcast are, but the cultural idea of radio is still very much at the heart of what's going on in uh, these online stations. And so, yeah, it is meant to be a kind of ironic uh, title as well. So I, I'm only interjecting because I wrote that title. In well, <laughs> in my, Thanks, but Patty. <laughs> when I hear a radio, I think free. You need to, well, but, you need to change centuries. But, but, but radio means free, and, and internet is not free. I, no, I don't know anywhere I can get internet for free. So to me, that's the big difference. 
Uh, there's a lot of free Wi-Fi. There's the uh, Ile Saint Fi here. There's, I mean, you still needed devices to listen to radio. Yeah, and I think that that whole question and this whole conversation, and thanks for highlighting, defining that cultural definition of radio, Patty. I think that that is sort of the point of this and what you were just asking is that the idea of radio has changed so much over since it first started. And maybe you can look up the exact year that the first radio waves were broadcasted. But the whole concept and, and dynamic of this medium has shifted and changed so much over the years. And I think that we're talking about the, and here to discuss the, the different ways in that that is changing and adapting to new technologies. And it's undeniable that this, this platform, the internet that's connecting millions of people across the world is, you know, where radio is going to adapt to that. You can listen to AM stations and AM radios on, online. Uh, so, you know, we're doing basically the same things but without the overburdening infrastructure that's required and technology that's required to broadcast physical radio waves, or not physical radio waves, but radio waves. Um, it's a great point that you raised about the government restrictions, and, and that's one of the best things about online radio is that you are free from those, those uh, regulatory restrictions. Uh, I used to host a... As long as net neutrality is in effect. Great point, sign your petitions um, and vote in your local elections. But basically, <laughs> sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, the government restrictions, you have experience on college and community campus, Canadian radio. I worked at CJLO here and, and was a volunteer radio host on CJLO for four years and the requirements that the government so can requires you to play at least a percentage of Canadian content. Web radio is free from that. It's a lot more of an accessible and open medium that people can do the exact same thing that you're doing on any other platform or radio. Um, for now, that's the way it is, and we're free from those constraints, and I think that that opens up a lot of the benefits uh, that previous iterations of radio were restricting. Uh, we can do it in all sorts of different languages. We can play music from parts of the world that, that previous regulations wouldn't let you do entirely. And it's just so much more of an open and free platform that I think totally uh, is just a logical progression of how radio as a uh, medium has like transformed over these decades from being something that was only accessible from governments to play to their people to being something that anybody can start in their bedroom and disseminate to the whole world. Like that's an incredible shift in power dynamic that is radio. <laughs> like it's content being broadcast to the ears of someone in different location. It's that. That's if I my may, definition. Um, that's all true. I, I love what you said. And I also love what you said about, in your definition, about it's broadcasting, but locally. So if, um, for instance, I love this movie, Pump Up the Volume. It inspired me to make my radio, actually. And... Um, I, I bet he, he could all only broadcast around his school, actually. So there's something there in the, the technology that made it possible. But to me, it doesn't mean we, it cannot change. We're talking each time we hear the, the word radio in a, a song, do they talk about transmission and technical definition of it? I'm pretty sure they never think about that. Tasha, could I ask a question? Sure. Hi. Um, I was, I had a question for Jean Denis. Um, you mentioned, hi, I'm over here. Um, you mentioned at the beginning uh, that you sort of 
making La Fesse Bay was um, sort of a reaction to um, campus and community radio, but you didn't really get into sort of what sorts of limitations you ran up against with the campus community model. So perhaps it's a continuation of the last question, like what exactly inspired you to move outside of those terrestrial radio platforms and, and go online? Yeah, I was inspired by, uh, by firstly, uh, I'm trained uh, in computer science. So I was interested in the technology maybe first of uh, the web casting, let's say. So uh, when I was in Shiz FM in uh, U Laval, um, it, it's been a long time now, but was the beginning of the podcast so they put it available but it was not really working actually um, and there wasn't a lot of space if I remember well and uh, yeah so it didn't cut the the show so sometimes you will you lost the, the beginning of your show so when I think uh, making a radio show is an art so when you take time to build an hour of radio and it's not available for everyone because it's small, obviously a, a, a college radio, it, you don't access a lot of people uh, unless um, they are in their car. <laughs> so it's important to have podcasts and it's important that for the people who are making it that uh, there's a respect of, of the actual uh, show and and you you need good quality and uh, yeah I don't know if it I answered all your question but thanks well just picking up on this thread of radio being like a cultural concept here um, if radio I read something recently with um, uh, in Saudi Arabia, there's some, some, some activists, some, some women activists who started an online radio station as a means to document what's happening um, within, within that uh, country. And one line I really liked from that was, you know, radio is an archive of the present. And so I'm, I'm kind of curious about what archive of the present your stations are, are building or creating. Do you want to, Sandra? But, uh, um, I think what the Lake are trying to do is to create, uh, yeah, an, an, an alternative to the search button on Spotify. Like, we're trying to capture all, uh, all the sounds that aren't being played uh, neither on commercial radio or presented on Spotify or other platforms, um, and and we just we to us or to me um, it's kind of incredible to listen to um, music from Nigeria uh, followed by um, noise from Copenhagen. So we're trying to like capture the, yeah, and capture like the experimental music scene that has happened today, but also with a respect for the past and trying to look into the future giving, uh, uh, by giving uh, the lake as a platform for uh, upcoming undiscovered uh, artists or creative souls who want to experiment. Um, that's also why some of our mixes, we call them mixes, but they're actually a walk and a talk or um, uh, a recording of uh, a, an unreleased live set or it could be anything. Um, yeah, so I think our archive will be that, if, yeah. I think it's a good question because there, obviously we are participating in uh, in putting more stuff in, into the internet and there's a, a lot of stuff already. So I think we should focus on uh, 
um, go through all the the stuff for people to help people actually who doesn't have time maybe to go through a bunch of music and stuff like that because we what's modern actually is to have access to past music and and maybe anything that's been recorded in the entire humanhood. So it's, it's, it's a pretty big library. <laughs> I think it's a very big question uh, and kind of makes me f feel very responsible. Um, and th therefore I feel or I think that um, maybe first and foremost we're creating an archive of people uh, so so one thing is what they're playing but like if once again you look back uh, after 10 years um, and you see all the people that uh, do something important and then like the overall picture should show what was important during these times and not only what was like trending but what meant something for people. And that's also one of the reasons we really want to have more and more talk shows as well. So we would talk about things that... Um, um, I also have to find a new word for important. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you get the point. Profound? Wow. <laughs> um, I agree with basically, yeah, all of that, especially we're archiving people and, and sort of like things that are just going on at these times. It's so really maybe we are in an online museum. <laughs> people cast. We're, um, yeah, it's impossible to sort of like remove the, all the, the life from, from anything like people are putting out there. So if it's recorded on a certain date, it's possibly reflective of what's going on in the world, or maybe it might just be music. But if it's talk, it's either celebrity gossip about something that John Travolta did, big shout out to Brunch Club, which is a Sunday gossip show on our station. Uh, they do a weekly catch up with John Travolta and Lindsay Lohan, so very reflective of the times. Um, it's a big difference and a big uh, divergence from what the traditional definition of radio would be because none of that stuff was really archived and logged and disseminated on the internet. We, at least our station, will have maybe a few listeners for a live program, but that archive can get thousands of plays throughout the course of however long it's hosted. So, uh, you know, the archives are such it was just an important part of us and our station of documenting what we're doing. But yeah, it's about documenting who came through the station, what we were doing, what was sort of important to these people at the time, important to us, just the different sh shifting trends. And I think that it's interesting. There's way too much to ever comb through there to actually like get any real information from it. But uh, it's there, and it's there forever. So. Yeah, one thing we also do, so we take pictures of every host and every guest, and we also save them. Mm. Yeah, so it's not only about, like, the music or, or, like, the actual sound recording, but it is about the people, because, like, in the end, they are the ones doing the radio. We just, we just get the C container. Well, we have just a few minutes left here for any questions from the audience. If anybody wants to uh, ask anything. Mm -hmm. Hi. Uh, it's not a question. It's just a comment. Um, I have a show at La FSB, and I just wanted to say thank you to uh, Jean-Denis for... Uh, for his support, and I mean, like, he he taught me how to program my show. I still don't get a few details <laughs> on airtime, but uh, it's been amazing. And uh, he's, you know, he, he did this from A to Z, and 
I mean, of course, having studied in computer science helps a lot, but there are all those technical details that, uh, I don't know, I, I just find it amazing that he's created this web radio or webcast um, by himself, and uh, I really enjoy uh, putting out um, new music every week on his platform, and I, I wanted to thank him. <laughs> so that's another Thank thing. Thanks to you, maybe. Sorry, it's so it's like it's so crazy when people do this, like say thank you. It just once again just makes you feel like oh, what you know, I haven't done anything. Uh, so th th this is like super rewarding and maybe like even more rewarding than like a funding could be, because when you do something and then someone comes out and says. So it's pretty funny, some people just come and they're like, I've listened all to all of the shows and if I can't do it live, then I go and listen them back. And it's just like, it's, you know, somehow so like really heartwarming. And, and another thing is that when we do our programming, we try to not only invite DJs, but just people who we think when it comes, for example, the music shows people we know that have like great or very just broad um, taste in music, and it doesn't matter that they don't know how to use uh, or how to mix. Like it doesn't matter that that the content is important, and that's why we have producers who are there to technically assist mm, all the hosts. So yeah, say thank you uh, to your uh, founders. <laughs> Yeah, no, I just think like comments like that are just like so, uh, they're not rare, but they're like so appreciated because this work is so difficult and it's so easy to get lost in the nitty gritty, but this is what these platforms are that we've created. And I think like uh, maybe that's the, the dissatisfaction with commercial or uh, mainstream radio that, that people don't have access to those things. But I think that these... Uh, webcast station websites are super important in in fostering uh, and teaching people these skills that that are not hard, but it takes a lot of practice and it takes people uh, opening their doors and providing all of this equipment and expertise and and confidence and able to 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 pull these things off and like we're so thankful and we thank every one of our hosts for making our station what it is and, you know, show after show. Um, but it's just like, uh, yeah, it's so easy to forget. <laughs> also, one of our hosts got a show on uh, Red, Li Red Light Radio in Amsterdam because she had shows on Ita Radio. And this is, for me, it's like a success story. Just, I'm mm -hmm. so proud. Um, so yeah, things like this as well are, yeah. so, so this is one of the reasons we do it. So people who are talented could actually showcase what they know and what they can do so they could get all the attention they are worth. Provides resources for people to show what they're doing. They can share these mixes with promoters across the world and it provides them that outlet and, it, and it's just like a cascading uh, effects. So it's, it's so it's cool. Amazing. It's so amazing. It's the, empower, the empowerment angle. It is empowering. It is. I think for a lot of people. Um, well, that's that's it. I've got the note saying this is the end. Um, so thank you. This is just the beginning. This is actually just the beginning. But I have um, all of our emails. <laughs> but thank you to everybody here on stage. Um, this was thank really, really wonderful. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Tasha. And we'll see you on the dance floor tonight.